Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning, everybody. Scott Luton and special guest host, Tony Sharota, uh, with you here on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's episode. Tony, how you doing? I'm doing great, but you got big shoes for me to fill. I don't know if I can replace Greg White yet. You know, <laughs> we're, we're trying, but the man has a great sense of humor and, and knowledge. And, I, and I, I'm honored to be trying to fill in for him. Well, I appreciate that. Talk about big shoes. Here today, as we continue our reverse logistics series, which, of course, Supply Chain now does in partnership with the, uh, the fine folks over the Reverse Logistics Association, we got a Hall of Famer, basically. Uh, big guest, business leader that some call the father of the reverse logistics industry. So stay tuned, folks, as Tony and I work really hard with our guests to raise your supply chain IQ. Tony, you excited about this like I am? Absolutely. It's a great chance to talk to, like you said, the father of this all. So with no further ado, let's introduce our guest here today. We're talking with a titan of industry. Our guest joined Genco back in 1971, where he became his family's third generation to be involved in the logistics business. It's in his blood, probably. Uh, he grew Genco to employ over 12,000 team members worldwide. Wow while developing quite a reputation for driving innovation in the industry. To that end, our guest is past recipient of the CSCMP Distinguished Service Award. That is the highest honor that that organization bestows upon individuals that have made a significant career-long contribution to the supply chain management profession. Now, not only that, if we, we'd be here all day if we read off all the accolades, but also he's been honored as the first recipient of the Reverse Logistics Association Lifetime Achievement Award, but he's not done yet. But again, that's just two from a long list of honors and recognitions. So with no further ado, let's welcome in Herb Shear, Chairman, G2 Reverse Logistics. Herb, how are you doing, sir? Good, good. How are you doing today? We are doing wonderful. Good. And we've been really excited about this conversation, haven't we, Tony? We have. It's uh, great to get to the roots that have led to everything else that's being done that's great. Man, so when you hear that, Herb, and we're going to talk about um, getting to know you a little better in a, in a moment, but what a sense of fulfillment when you hear folks talk about your journey and your contributions uh, in industry, leadership, really, in industry, huh? It was, uh, it, it was and still is a good, uh, a good journey. Uh, it's still an underappreciated uh, area that has uh, lots of potential uh, for, for companies to uh, in, improve what they're doing for their customers and improve the profitability. So it's, it's, still, a good, it's still a good journey. Well, and you're not done yet. I'm glad you made that point. Um, and the other thing, Tony, I hope when, when uh, it's all said and done uh, and, and after our time industry, man, to be, be called the father of anything, man, uh, you'd have to be keeping my ego in check, maybe. I don't know. But uh, we get a chance to dive into that story here today with Herb Shear. So, Tony, uh, we're going to start with getting to one of our favorite questions around here is where folks grew up. Where are they from? So, Herb, if you could indulge us, where did you grow up? And, and give us a few anecdotes about your upbringing. Uh, sure. I grew up in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania um, and was here through junior high school. Then I went to uh, boarding uh, high school in Eastern Pennsylvania, uh, and then ended up in college at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, um, in Illinois. Um, so, and then I came back and then I came back to Pittsburgh. So clearly Pittsburgh plays a big, big chapter, a uh, big common theme in your journey. What do you, what do you love the most when you think back before you went to boarding school, um, when you think about those earlier moments, you know, growing up in Pittsburgh as a kid, what was one of your favorite parts to that? Uh, it was a good, it, it was a good city to, to, to grow up in. Um, with my father and grandfather, I got a kind of always got an orientation to what business was like and how important it was to service customers. 
because uh, they ran a small trucking company. Uh, so uh, it, it, it was a good upbringing. So one final question about that, because we, we, as we mentioned, you're third generation in logistics. And clearly, as you just shared there, you must have learned a lot from your grandfather and father who were in the industry. Um, one of the things you mentioned was taking care of the customer. Any other lifeless or, or um, uh, um, constant lesson, timeless lessons, what I'm trying to say, that you picked up from your father or grandfather? Yeah, I, I, I think they kept things simple and it was really uh, two, two basic tenets is uh, take, care, take care of your customers and, and treat the people who, who work for you, who do take care of your customers really well. So those were, you know, two, two basic business tenants that I grew up with. Love that. Love that. All right. So Tony, I know there's plenty more there, but we've got a, a an hour with Herb Shear here. Where are we going next, Tony? Well, we're going to talk with Herb a little bit about the journey. And, um, and this is a, a, an unusual journey, but it's a family journey, Herb. Uh, you, you basically grew up in the environment that you wound up in. But before you got to that corner office, Herb, uh, you did a number of roles at, at Genco, and it might help people in the audience to kind of listen in and, and talk about where you started with your hands on and how you got to that corner office and the steps along the way, because it wasn't just given to you, Herb, right? We know that. And so we'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Uh, sure. Um, my family was uh, primarily in the trucking business and ran a trucking company about 15 20 trucks that serviced about a 50 mile radius of Pittsburgh. And this was, this was pre uh, deregulation back, back in uh, the seventies when I came in and beyond and before that uh, transportation was regulated. Uh, and my dad dabbled a little bit in warehousing. So when I came into the business, there was a uh, warehouse operation that wasn't doing very well. And, uh, said, why don't you go over there and see what you can do with this thing? And the name of the warehouse was General Commodities Warehouse and Distributing Company. It was a real mouthful. So that's where <laughs> Genco, the acronym Genco came from. Um, some people think it came from the Godfather. If you've watched Godfather 2, his company was Genco also. So, so we always got our bills paid. Never had a problem with that. <laughs> Uh, but, but, I, but, but I went into this uh, warehouse that employed about 15 Teamsters and operated about 80,000 square feet of space and, uh, that's, and uh, started to turn, turn it around. Well, it was warehousing and you mentioned Teamsters and being from Pittsburgh and my being from Detroit. I think we could have a lot of really good stories that we can't discuss on camera, but but yeah. you started with that facility. And at one point you woke up and said, uh, you know, this is a warehouse. There's a lot of warehouses. I'm going to do something a little different with this warehouse. And so how did you come to that idea of, of going after the returns that nobody else was thinking about? Yeah, uh, it, it really started... Um with a, uh, a customer request. We were uh, doing uh, overflow warehousing for a company called Farmore, uh, which is no longer in business. It was ended up being a big corporate scandal. Uh, uh, but they were growing like a weed and they called us one day and said, our distribution center is clogged up with all these returns coming back from our stores. Do you have some place we could store these returns? And we're looking for a software program that we can use to process them. Uh, and I said, uh, sure, we have the space. And we had three people on a, uh, in, in a systems group. And I said, if you tell us the specifications of what you want, uh, we'll, we'll write the uh, software and um, we would like the commercial rights to, to uh, market it. And they said, and they said fine. So, so we went ahead and uh, I did that. And the in, initial software that we wrote in the processing center that we set up for them was really for, for chain drug and grocery, uh, which, which was a different style return than, uh, you know, we actually, you know, got into and really grew. But, but, that's, how it, but that's how it got started. Uh, then around 19, I think it was around 1992, 
um, we were approached by Target. They, they were looking for somebody to run a return center for them and also provide them with software. Uh, and we, we uh, pitched them. They liked our pitch. They hired us. We rewrote the software for mass merchant retailing. Uh, and it took off. It, it, it took off after that. Every, every uh, major retailer wanted it. So give, give us a really quick, give us a, um, uh, a, a, what year are we talking? When, when, especially when you wrote the first software and then when you walk, wrote yeah. the software here, what, what, what time frame was that? Yeah. So the uh, first version of software was written around uh, 1988, 89. Uh, and initially until 90, 1992, we were selling software to the chain drug and grocery industry. Yep. Uh, um, and the, that's really, their, their returns are kind of basic uh, because generally in the grocery industry, most gets donated to food banks or, or it has to be disposed of if it, if it can't be used. Um, chain, chain drugs, some, some, somewhat similar. Uh, so, so when we got the opportunity with Target, that changed the whole model to consumer, to uh, con consumer returns, which had lots of various disposition uh, options, much, much more sophisticated type of returns. Well, I, I mean, it was it was famous in the industry. It was called Arlog. It was the right. first. And right. Scott, we talk about this all the time. Nobody really does good software for the reverse side. So Herb and, and Genco created not only the first software, but as you said, Herb, geared towards mass merchants. And although Target was your first date, you quickly uh, got uh, into the dating circle with Walmart and with <laughs> Sears and with Kmart. I mean, you dated a few of the winners out there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it, it became very popular among the major, uh, among, among the major retailers. Uh, and even a lot of their suppliers. Mm. Well, you know, I, I got to just comment on Farmore. I hadn't heard that name in a long time. And I grew up in Aiken, South Carolina, where there was a Farmore in the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. And and they were, you could get just about anything, including rent video games and movies in, in Farmore. Um, and, and, you know, <laughs> that's such a different time. But it, it's so interesting that, that that first opportunity in kind of a somewhat niche market gave you the opportunity, uh, uh, um, provided an innovation opportunity for your team to, to start to change, Tony, to change the reverse logistics side of, of global supply chain, which of course was important then and has even gotten only more important now, huh? Well, well now that we're dating ourselves a little bit, Scott, <laughs> Herb, I think in 1992, when you launched this with, with your first date with Target, I don't think there was even a term reverse logistics being used. That, and, yeah, that's correct. That's correct. And uh, it didn't come into play until I think it was James Stock, Dr. James Stock, put it in a book in around 1996. And then, of course, going backwards. And what was also interesting about what Genco did, Scott, is every year, I, I don't want to say it was a party, but it was a get together of all of the major clients of Genco. And it was an opportunity not just to get together, but her made a, a, made the uh, uh, intention of bringing in the industry voices, the smart people in the room. Mm. Her brought them into the room, and I know from experience around 1998, 99, I attended one of the events and I heard Dr. Dale Rogers uh, speak about reverse logistics, and that was the term when I first started getting into it to hear it. And and so her, you put on those events. You brought everyone together and it wasn't just really to have a good time. It was really designed to help sh uh, share stories, share best practices and try to push it. And I was always impressed, Herb, that you focused on doing that at Genco. That was, that was really something. Thank you. Appreciate it. So let's, I'm going to still one of your questions, Tony, uh, okay. speaking of Genco and clearly what, with what you just stated there. Um, speaking to the success of the organization, the growth or, of the organization. Herb, what else, when you think of, of just how much y'all grew Genco and where you started and where you ended up and the corner office, Tony mentioned, and, and all the opportunities you provided for your team members while also ch driving change in industry, what was some of the secrets of your success there? Uh, I, I think it was actually uh, 
pretty simple. And, and what I'm going to say, I don't think there's anybody in business who wouldn't say the same thing. I think it's just the way that we executed it. Um, and what, what we did, we had a really simple mission statement. Uh, and it was uh, nine words. And everybody in the company could, could remember it and, and focus. And it goes back to those basic tenants I was talking about my father and grandfather. It was value to customers, value to teammates, uh, continue to be a profitable company to reinvest back in the business. That, that, was, our, uh, that, that was our mission. Uh, but I think the, the, the way we uh, used it uh, and got everybody focused on it uh, is what made, made, made us successful. Um, we measured it. Um, so the financial part is easy to measure. Everybody has financials. You know how well, well you're doing financially. Um, every, every quarter, uh, everybody on our senior management team, which was about 10, had to call six or seven customers and survey them. Uh, we, I, I, we, we didn't want an outside firm to do it. And when we first started doing that, I said, we can't do that because they'll tell us things we don't want to hear. <laughs> and I said, we do want to hear it because how else can we fix it <laughs> and, and uh, <clears throat> make it better? Because value to customers means we're, we're, we're never going to settle for status quo. We always have to keep doing better, find out what our customers want us to do better. Better. Um, and we, we were able to ma measure that and reward, um, based on the success of, uh, of the value that, that our customers felt we were creating for them. Felt the same way about our teammates. We wanted, um, Genco to be a really good place to work. So we, we surveyed, um, a third of our teammates every four months. So over a year, a hundred, almost a hundred percent and said, uh, you know, how are, how are we doing as a, uh, how are we doing as a company? Are we, is this a good place to work? Because we thought if our teammates felt good about coming to work every day, the beneficiaries were going to be our customers. If they didn't feel good about coming to work, who, who was going to suffer our customers? Um, are we going to suffer? So I think the way we did it differently is that we, we actually, we, you know, measured it and rewarded for good success. And Scott, what I think we just heard is net promoter score before it was net promoter score. That's that that that's no it's a secret, Scott, but in a way it's not. It's it's just yeah. basic treating people right. And and the fact that you, you're right, I, I could see how you scared your people when you said we're gonna call up our customers and ask them what they think of us. I mean that's that's that sounds radical, except it's basic. So right. it, it's a great secret that you shared, her. Well, you know. Thank you. Also, her, you know, no one likes bad news, but if we don't take the time to listen to it, to your point, nothing changes, right? Yeah, exactly. It stays in our blind spot and we keep uh, underserving customers, right? Yeah, we can fix an issue when it's a small issue. If we don't know about it over time, it becomes a big issue. Right. Excellent point. Um, okay. So, Tony, I hate, the, I hate to leave the Genco story. There's so much more there, I'm sure, but we want to kind of, where are we going next with with Herb? Well, let's let's one last part of the Genco story. And and Herb, it, there are some secrets to the success that you just shared, and that's important. But timing is everything in life as well. In 1992, it was the beginning of the birth of the mass merchants, uh, the mass channel stores, who were by and large taking everything back from customers, no matter what. Yeah. So the WalMarts and the Sears and the Kmart's and the Targets, they were all taking so many returns back that timing is everything. Genco, Herb, you were in the right place at the right time and you helped them with their returns problems and they kept growing their business because returns were easy and you found solutions and, it, and it's just an, it's an amazing journey of timing and persistence at the same time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Retailers started, one of the things they started competing on was uh, ease of returns yeah. that yep. you could. Uh, but what was interesting about that when, uh, when the economy, uh, the economy used to cycle more than it, it, it's done in the 2000 <laughs> right. so far. So when, when, when business was good, uh, the retailers would kind of 
cut back a little bit on the ease of returns. And when we were in a down cycle, they were uh, they, 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 they they eased up substantially. Sometimes we got more returns in a down cycle than an up cycle. <clears throat> exactly, exactly. So uh, that's that's the Genco story. Now you've turned this into G two, a little bit different company. Uh, so if you want to tell us a little bit about G two and what G two is looking to do. Ah, uh, sure. Uh, <clears throat> So, so G2 is designing um, a different type of software uh, for reverse logistics. <clears throat> and I think the best way I can explain it is um, our, our log uh, was, was a really good piece of software, but it was dynamic, it, it was static in the sense that uh, once you establish dispositions uh, for where, where product would go, uh, those dispositions just stayed uh, static. They, they very seldom changed. Uh, and you just, if it's gonna be a vendor return, it'll, it's always gonna be a vendor return. If it's gonna go to liquidation, it's always gonna go to liquidation. If it's gonna be donated and so on <clears throat> and uh, so forth. Uh, and and, and I, I think that was good because most returns, all returns then were store returns. Uh, right. now, now the market's different because you've got uh, e-commerce returns, brands that, that are you know, selling both to retail customers and to consumers, uh, brand returns, uh, and omni-channel returns. <laughs> so it's, uh, it, it, it's, a, it, it's a whole different array um, of returns. And the, so the new software now is is going to be dynamic because we can use tools we didn't have back then. We can use uh, power for analytics. We can use um, AI or art artificial intelligence. And we can look at a return from the time it's initiated and start making decisions about that return that'll handle it for the least amount of cost and get the best uh, recovery for it. You can almost uh, predict them these days. Her. Yeah, that, yeah, uh, and that, and and that's what it's going to, and and that's why I, I would describe it as being dynamic because it's going to be predictive in both uh, uh, reducing cost of of how many touches and how much transport has to occur, and then where's the best place for it to land to get the highest recovery value. Net re the the one term I always use is uh, now is net recovery because. Uh, the, the highest recovery you'll always get is selling it online, but that's a gross recovery. Yes. And once you, it, once you take all the costs away, you have a net uh, recovery. Uh, so, so it's very, it's very possible. You can sell a, a pallet of stuff and get a bet, a better net recovery for that pallet than selling it piece by piece uh, on, on, online uh, for, for everything that's on that pallet. So, so I got to add, it's fascinating. I got to ask both of y'all this question. Did you ever think we'd live in an age where folks would buy a pallet from a retailer and unpack it on YouTube, uh, which, which is a moneymaker in and of itself. And then of course, whatever they want to resell, uh, from that pallet, it, these are, these are, these are intriguing times we're living in Herb and Tony, right? Those, those are entrepreneurs uh, that are amazing to your point, Scott and, and her, they, they existed back then. Um, they would buy this liquidation back then, but they didn't have YouTube to show themselves off in and, um, and, 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 and just turn it into a story. And, right. and they're becoming actors and they're becoming, uh, uh, you know, used car salesmen. And, <laughs> yep. and, and, and no, uh, Herb, you and I never thought we'd see that, right? <laughs> That's for sure. It's a whole different, uh, whole, whole different time now with all the different technology. You know, Herb, as you're as you're sharing your journey here, both with Genco and with G two, and just the reverse logistics um, it, itself, it seems like there's a lot of old, common, consistent challenges. It's just, and then some new and some with new wrinkles. It, it's um, we're still trying to solve some of the same challenges that are timeless. It's just, we're doing it in a different landscape in some, in, in some way, shape or form. Would you agree with that, Herb? Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I think we have better tools today than we had uh, 10 and 15 years ago uh, to, you know, to solve these problems with. Uh, so it's definitely a, a better landscape. And, and I would also, uh, Tony, we've talked about this quite a bit. Uh, the consumers also seemingly want more and more um, smarter, savvier approaches to, um, to really handling and processing returns to take advantage of that. What would you call it? Net, um, what'd you call net, it? Her net recovery, net recovery. Right. So, so things see shelves again and give other folks a chance to, to, um, use and purchase the product, right? That's, that's, seems like consumers really want smarter strategies there, huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd agree. Um, uh, and I, I, I think because, because e-commerce is really, uh, you know, propelled that. And when you, you know, you look at the, um, when, when it was just brick and mortar stores, uh, average return rates were three, four percent across a Walmart or a Target uh, or a Sears or a Kmart. Um, to today, when you blend, uh, you know, you blend omni-channel and e-commerce and every, everything, you're, you're 10 to 12 percent return rates uh, wow. on, 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 on products. So, uh, uh, there's a there's a lot more of it, and uh, it need it it needs to find its second home. I love that. Okay, so you've already spoke that one one of the questions we we've asked. I think it's already kind of come up, and that's when when you had that eureka moment that you uh, found your a passion for reverse logistics and returns processing and that and and that seemed to be part of that first um, that first software build uh, back in the the late '80s. Was that where your passion um, for were all things reverse logistics started? No, I think it really started uh, with uh, when we were, were able to um, uh, pitch Target and have them uh, hire us. Um, that became, that's what made it really exciting. That, that, that brought us into a really uh, new and exciting market. Gotcha. When it went a bit broader and there was a, there was yeah. a bigger opportunity, right? Yeah. And the company just started to take off like crazy. It was like the Wild West. I love that. It always yeah. paints a, a, a neat, fun image. Yeah. We talk about the wild, wild west of, of gosh, off uh, yeah. supply chain uh, containers shipping all these days. Right, Tony? And, and Scott, let's let's attach to that the fact that prior to that moment, when when Herb got this Genco operation going as a centralized return center, everything was decentralized. It either was handled at the store level or it went back to the original shipping warehouse, which was a disaster completely. And it gets shoved off into a corner, right, Herb? And then yeah. once a year, somebody would come along and say, yeah, I'll give you a hundred bucks for all that junk. It was, it was the, you talk about the Wild Wild West, it was crazy, right, Herb? Oh, yeah. Yeah. In fact, that Sears was throwing it all away in landfills. Uh, they, they were just, uh, they, they had every year, they, they had, uh, a, a supplier of the year bank, banquets and awards and we went and i'm sitting at this table with all of their major suppliers from whirlpool and uh you, you know who are selling them hundreds of millions of dollars of stuff and they're looking at me like why are you at this table and then um martinez the ceo got up and announced that uh, genco is their supplier of the year wow uh and in, in their annual report they listed us as one of the three reasons for turnarounds because we put about three hundred million dollars on their bottom line because they were throwing all the stuff away. Wow! So that and and uh, pun intended to have reverse logistics have a seat at the table. Uh, that seemed to be one of the earliest moments where it truly did, and 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 with good reason, given the impact you just shared. Yeah, yeah. All right. So you don't you don't often, Tony, to get to sit down and pick the brain of the father of anything. Uh, here in this case, the father <laughs> of reverse logistics. Let's, um, let's kind of pull the story forward, right? 2021 and, and uh, kind of a look ahead. Um, fascinating times. All right, Tony, you and I both have chatted about how we hope that business schools out there, they've got no shortage of stories to, to be teaching for, for years and years to come at a minimum, right? I, I held my hand up yesterday and asked the class, uh, the workshop I was teaching, does anyone know of a school teaching a degree in reverse logistics yet? No one knows. It, it does, it's not out there. All of these top 25 supply chain schools from Penn State, Arizona State, to Rutgers, to on and on and on, 
Herb and I know no one teaches reverse logistics. They squeeze it into a supply chain class, maybe. And, maybe. And, and as Herb's indicating, and as we've said so many times, there's so much complexity to this. Right. It, it frankly, it, it, I think Herb already alluded to the fact that it needs artificial intelligence to deal with all of these complexities of a return versus the forward side. I mean, I love that you guys are the supply chain uh, school of uh, hard knocks and information, but it's a lot simpler on the forward side than, than on the reverse. And Herb, you've lived through it and you've talked about what the company now needs to do to really uh, be an advantage for, for, for returns. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it, the, I, I don't think there's an appreciation of how, as you were saying, Tony, is how complex the uh, reverse supply chain is. Mm. Uh, and all and all the different pieces that um, have to be put together and determine which ones fit best uh, uh, for each situation. Uh, and I, I I I think it's uh, it, it's somewhat overlooked. Um, but if uh, you know, with return rates being so high, if uh, companies aren't serious about um, how they're going to handle their returns. Uh, it, it's really going to Im, Im, impact their profitability. Mm. Excellent. And their reputation, which we're going to touch on yeah, yep, yeah. here in a second. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. I, I love, by the way, going back to your story about uh, when you first developed software for far more, I love how that starts with, give me some specs, give me some specs. You know, uh, mm -hmm. if we can, if we can have specs and inputs so that we can take advantage of the latest tools, you know, we will better, we'll better the industry and, and, uh, and, and how we process returns as well as how do we educate consumers, which we're all consumers, of course, and not, not hitting anybody over the head, but you know, these behaviors of, of buying 10, trying, trying on all 10 and sending eight back. I yeah. mean, you know, that's, that's, that's not good. That's not good. And just because you can do it, you know, uh, think twice, but anyway, um, Tony, you were going to say something. On, on that specs conversation, Scott, it's important to remember what Herb was alluding to about the new software they've developed that's dynamic. Right. And dynamic means it has to respond to, and, and having worked at Phillips for so many years, the nightmare was we were trying to sell return goods and they were selling for less on the internet. And it's like, that doesn't work. <laughs> so there's there's an example of the complexity that that a dynamic system like, like Herb and G2 have developed now uh, Herb, if I understand it, you're looking at everything across the internet, all the different options. There are times, as you said, when it's better to donate. There's times when it's better to sell a pallet of, of I don't want to use the word junk, of, of returns. And there's times where it's better to pull every piece out and sell it individually and think about the software that, that Herb and, and G2 have created to do that, Scott. It, it's very, very complicated. Mm, I love that. Herb, any That's additional correct. thoughts, sir? No, Tony described it really well. <laughs> All I've right. learned well. I've learned yes. from the best, Scott. That's, that's <laughs> part of it here. I'm, I'm giving you the words that Herb has given to me over the years. <laughs> well, you know, regardless, if you're talking software to uh, handle uh, and, and uh, react with the change of landscape to handle uh, returns processing, if you're talking shipping, you're, you name it these days, a dynamic solution is uh, the best way to go, right? It gives most flexibility and, uh, and, and changes on a moment's notice. So look forward to learning more about G2 in the months ahead, Herb. Um, all right, what else? When you, when you survey the current landscape or where the reverse logistics industry is headed, what are anything we hadn't touched on yet? What else intrigues you about where we are right now, Herb? Uh, I, I think what's intriguing to me is that it's uh, a growing market, a large as a supplier into a marketplace, uh, it, it's a it's a growing market. It's a market that the pie is getting bigger and and bigger, and the number of uh, competitors that are playing in the market are relatively small. If you compare it to supply chain, you, you know, in the right. in in, su in supply chain, you got hundreds, of, maybe thousands of uh, com companies competing with each other. Right. Uh, you don't you don't have that, that that in reverse logistics. Um, you, you know, when do you expect that to change and do you expect there to be a lot more entrance into the reverse logistics industry in the years to come? 
Any any predictions there? I, I think we're seeing a lot of uh, 3PLs that that want to get in or say you know they can do reverse logistics, um, but they don't know how to. Mm. Uh, and you really can't do it without software. If if you don't have a software s- solution, you you really can't do uh, uh, in any type of meaningful reverse logistics programs. Mm. That's a great point, uh, Tony. Anything to add? The other aspect of that, Herb, is there's there's not enough players, as you indicated, on the supply chain side compared to that. Uh, but more important is the retailers and the manufacturers want an end to end solution. So they don't want just a company that handles the transportation and just one company handling the repair and just one company doing the reselling uh, and other resources. They kind of want end-to-end solutions these days, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I think that's correct. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So what, uh, you know, we we touched on brand and reputation uh, a moment ago, and and I want to pose a question along those lines to you, but anything else when, when it comes to, you know, it sounds like you got your fingers on the pulse Maybe all ten of them, Herb, on the on the pulse of what's going on across reverse logistics. Anything else stick out to you that you'd like to share with us? Uh, no, I think we've covered uh, a, a, a quite a bit. Uh, I, I think the only thing that kind of uh, amazes me was, uh, you know, back in the '90s at uh, CSCMP, you, you know, they were saying this, you know, reverse logistics is really something everybody's got to, got to get involved in. Uh, you, you, you know, this is really important stuff. And uh, 25 years later, it's still saying the same thing, I think. <laughs> yes. And, and they won't even invite me to speak there. Or I, yeah. I, it's just uh, unbelievable. But, but Scott, I do want to ask Curb about some trends that are out there that could be <clears throat> disturbing or interesting. And Herb, you're starting to see some companies, e-commerce companies, make a business decision to tell somebody to keep the product and give them a full credit instead of sending it back. What are your thoughts on that area? Yeah, I I think when you're looking at something that's really inexpensive, you take a a $5 item uh, and the cost of shipping it back and processing it, it's more more than it's worth. it's probably easier to say the consumer keep it. I don't, uh, my, my concern about it is, uh, is it going to lead to um, increased levels of fraud where, where, where I order, you know, I need, I, I need a package of batteries. So I order a package of batteries for five bucks and I say, uh, gee, you sent me the wrong batteries. And they say, well, keep it anyway. We'll, we'll send you more. Uh, uh, so, so there's really going to have to be, uh, uh, you, you know, real good software that monitors that and, and is able to uh, uh, determine where where fraud is occurring. Otherwise, I think it could lead to large levels of fraud. Uh, I, I think I, I think that'll mostly occur with with products that just uh, the, the value of them just isn't is, is, isn't worth the return cost. And then Herb, you've been aware of of the uh, the new. Uh, initiatives towards a circular economy and reverse logistics. I mean, circular economy doesn't happen without reverse. So how do you see reverse logistics playing more into that circular economy initiative globally? Uh, yeah, well, I, I think the, to, to some extent, um, it's, it, it, it's been circular. Uh, it's, it's just what I think. Being, being, being maybe <laughs> expressed more now because, uh, you, you sell an item, the uh, buyer keeps it, so so it's done. You you sell an item, the buyer returns it. So now you, now it's coming through, and you want to circulate that 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 item if you can back into the marketplace if that's what gets its uh, if that's what gets its best value. Um, I think that's what what basically uh, always has been happening. I think now it can just happen much more efficiently. Absolutely agree with that. Yes. Yep. Um, and as Tony likes to say, if you make it easy uh, for consumers to return their products, don't be surprised when they do. Citing us yeah. earlier, <laughs> increase in uh, uh, return rates. You, you you mentioned earlier, Herb. Um, 
All right. So let's talk about um, brand reputation and admiration. So Herb, when you, when you uh, as we, again, we're all consumers here, even if we happen to be uh, in supply chain in one shape or, or one way, shape or form, who do you admire when it comes to how they, uh, their reverse logistics and or returns approach? Uh, well, it's a small, it, it's a small industry. I actually really admire Tony. Uh, and I'm not saying it because he's, he, he's interviewing, but, but Tony has been involved with reverse logistics. I remember with Dale Rogers um, from, from, from the very beginning, uh, you know, he's been a part of this and uh, he's really taken our RLA um, to a, to a really new, new level. Our ROA was, it was okay, but it wasn't uh, doing what it really needed to do to promote the, uh, uh, the industry. And uh, Tony has really taken it to a level today where it encompasses a, a whole lot of different in, in industries, and it's really uh, raising, re you know, the uh, uh, view of reverse logistics and how important uh, uh, and, and how and how important it is. Uh, and um, and there's nobody else really out there doing that. And uh, I, I really admire. Uh, I, I, I really admire. I really admire that. Outstanding. Tony, that's high praise. It, it's uh, uh, unexpected and, and appreciated. And, and I'm really humbled. And I, and, 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 and in some ways, I, I so much appreciate that. And in some ways, I'm like, God, could we just get a couple more voices out here? <laughs> so that I'm not invited to every single supply chain event that's out there <laughs> like this week at Marcel Forum. It's like we need more voices because Herb, it's 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 as you said, it's it's important to elevate it. Mm. And we need more degree programs in it. And we need more focus on that customer satisfaction that that's lacking. And that's why people send things back. I mean, it's just it it uh, it can be it's way more involved than the forward side. Uh, and, and I do appreciate that. And I know Scott, you helped get the word out and we would really appreciate it. It, it needs to be out there. Uh, supply chain's important and certainly in the last 18 months, but the other, we haven't seen by the way, the result of the last 18 months on the, on the return side yet. Right. Right. We still believe there's trailers of returns sitting out there. So there's, uh, there's we need more help. We, yeah. we uh, to Herb's point, there's only a few players in it, and uh, yeah, you you could almost count them on two hands. The ones that are making impact, like G two, right? Uh, and, and we've gotten some of those on with this program. So, uh, well, Tony, we, really we, we just need to ordain some deacons for you that can help <laughs> heavy uh, carry the load and make <laughs> shape. Um, <laughs> All right. So let's talk. Uh, so we're talking the Shear Family Foundation next, Tony. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, Herb, uh, you've done this so long and, and, and it's meaningful that you've taken the time to develop an entire new uh, foundation from your side, from your family. Why don't you tell us what, uh, what you've done with the Shear Family Foundation and, and who you're helping? Uh, sure. So when we when we sold uh, Genco to FedEx, uh, we we formed uh, a family foundation with some of the proceeds uh, for, for, from from that sale. Uh, we're we're pretty focused on a few areas that that, that we want to support. Uh, one of our most important areas uh, was something I got involved with a long time ago uh, in with the Pittsburgh Food Bank is, is hunger insecurity. Uh, so. So that's a big that's a big funding initiative uh, for for us uh, in in the Pittsburgh area, uh, in the Chicago area, Las Vegas area, uh, where 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 we have other family members. Okay. Uh, we uh, we we support programs that help people get regular meals and and today nutritious uh, meals. Uh, we 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 also as part of that. Um, like the hurricane that just came through Louisiana, uh, it, it creates a tremendous need for food uh, until things can get back to normal. So we'll support um, food banks uh, in those areas to help them um, distribute food out to the to the people that that need it. Uh, one of the things we're running some prototype programs on that uh, we're 
uh, we're, we're we're seeing a little bit of uh, success with is um, there. There's two ways to attack uh, hunger. Uh, one one is um, when you talk to most food banks and you say, "What's your vision?" They'll say, "Our vision is to eliminate hunger." Well, un, or hunger insecurity. Un, unfortunately, it's been around for thousands of years, right. and, and the supply is, never meets the demand. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're trying to put we're we're looking at programs that attack demand, and say, "Is there are there ways to reduce the demand?" for food insecurity. So we're, we've been doing some prototype programs where we put a job counselor into a food pantry and someone coming in might just need some help with a resume. They might need a couple hundred dollars to get a certificate that shows you're qualified to do a certain type of work. And if they can get better employment, their need for food assistance might become, uh, might, might become less. Uh, we're, we're supporting another program that helps people, uh, should, teaches them how to grow their, their own food, become like urban farmers. Uh, and if they grow more than what they need, how to set up a little food stand and run a small business. Uh, nice. so, we're tr so we're trying to look at some in innovative programs on the uh, demand side as, as well as supporting the supply side of, of food insecurity. That, that's so perfect. That's leading by example, by the way, Herb. And, and I know that uh, Scott and Supply Chain Now have done a lot to promote uh, some of those important charities. And, and we've taken the position of also at our conference uh, pro promoting a, 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 a charity golf outing and, and, and giving all those funds to the cell phones for soldiers group. And so you've led by example and that, and that really counts in any organization, Scott, right? That's such a big thing. Deeds, not words. That's what it's all about. Deeds, not words. And, and yeah. certainly yeah. Herb Shear, you are a leader that takes action and strong bias for action. And we can't get enough of that. So it's been an honor to spend the last hour with you, you with you in particular, and joined by Tony here. And Tony, appreciate your your group uh, and what you do, and of course your facilitation to allow us to share Herb's journey and his and his um, uh, his insights with our global community. Absolutely, absolutely. But let's make sure. Uh, I'm hoping that some of our listeners are going to want to uh, check out G2. They're going to want to check out Sheer Family Foundation. What's the easiest way for them to uh, connect with you and your team, Herb? Um, I think the best way would be through LinkedIn because we've put so much security these days on, 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 on email uh, um, that sometimes emails don't all come through. Right. Uh, but my email address is herb at g2rl.com. Uh, so that's one way. But LinkedIn, uh, probably everything you know, would come through LinkedIn. LinkedIn's better. And, of course, you can also check out g to rl.com right correct wonderful herb shear chairman g2 reverse logistics father of the reverse logistics industry really appreciate your time here today don't go away just yet uh because tony i want to make sure folks know how to i mean gosh when you get praise from the one and only herb shear <laughs> folks need to know what you're up to at rla so how can folks connect with you well, the best way is our website, which is rla.org, rla.org, and uh, everything is there. Since we're an association, we show you who the members are. We show G2RL on our website. Uh, we show connections to our board members. Uh, I may have to finally pull down the uh, cell phone number, Scott, because uh, the malware that's coming through there now mm. and text messages is uh, abhorrent and, and won't stop. Uh, so we do respond to emails. We've, uh, uh, Herb's correct, the privacy uh, protection that we have to do these days is uh, overwhelming, but we have a site and people can find us through that site. We're based in Atlanta, as you know, uh, but we, we are a global organization with a voice in Europe, a voice in Asia, a voices in the US, and our focus, of course, is the member companies uh, of our community, uh, the retailers, the manufacturers, and then companies like Herbs that look to provide solutions for them. So uh, thank you for letting me mention it again. It is Tony at RLA.org. Uh, that easy on, on the email. So thank Just you. Just that easy. Just yeah. that easy. Okay. Um, 
Big thanks. Herb Shear, thanks so much for spending some time with us here today. Well, thank you for the opportunity. We all really appreciate uh, being with you and Tony. Absolutely. Right. We'll Great put our finger you, back Herb. on the pulse of what you're yep. up to soon. Uh, Tony Sherota, big thanks to you and RLA, t RLA team for what you do, pushing the industry forward, you know, for standing on the shoulders of titans like Herb Shear. Uh, folks, hopefully you enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. It's really, really a real treat for us here at Supply Chain Now. Be sure if you like conversations like this, uh, they all can't be this good, though. We, we always get great guests like Herb. Hey, but check us out wherever you get your podcasts from. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss conversations like that. You can also find us at supplychainnow.com. But most importantly, you've heard it. You've heard us talk about it here a lot in this conversation. Deeds, not words. On that note, do good. Give forward. But be the change that's needed in the world today. Be like Herb Shear. The world will be a better place. On that note, we'll see you next time right here at Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at SupplyChainNow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts. And follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now. <laughs>